Thank you so much for the introduction, Balkis. Um, Assalamu alaikum and a very warm, warm welcome to everybody. So today um, we have um, uh, Chia Yongling, who is the co-founder of Rangit Collective, a social enterprise that aspires to bring economic empowerment to rural communities and smallholder farmers working directly with communities to bring their agricultural produce to a large audience. He was talking about regenerative agriculture. So a warm welcome to Chia. You may uh, begin now. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you for the introduction. Shall we begin? All right. Yes, I think we can start. OK, uh, I will share my screen first. Um, can you see my slide? Yeah, but we cannot see you. Oh, I think it's fine. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Is it in full screen? Is it clear? Yeah. Right. Maybe you can also turn on your um, camera, so please. Um, yes. So, OK. Um, good morning, everyone. Uh, I'm Yong Ling, one of the co-founders of Langit Collective. So this is Uncle Liun, one of our farmers, uh, who is a petty farmer who lives in Long Samado, in the interior area of Lawas, Sarawak. So before I uh, start Langit, I don't know anything about regenerative agriculture. It's Uncle Liun who is the one who actually taught me about this one, how they've been farming their paddy. So they are the paddy farmers has been growing their paddy for hundreds of years. So what they do is they didn't apply any inputs at all. So they just plant and harvest. As we know, paddy is one of the most input intensive crops is also one of the most important step of food for us. So how they can do that without putting anything? So first we need to see, we need to look at how conventional rice farming. So how they do in conventional, first they need to do the weeding. So they do need to kill all the wheat first before they can use their tilling machine to do the tilling or even their paddy fields. So after that is the planting. So it's either transplanting or they will do bulk casting to the field. After that, once the paddy is grown, they will do another down weeding again using the weedy side to kill off all the other weeds because they don't want the competition from the weeds. And before harvest, they need to apply at least four times of fertilizer. That's including all the urea, MPK, all this kind of fertilizer before they do the then the cycle repeat again. So as you can see, it's very input intensive. So if they didn't apply all these chemicals, they cannot ensure their yields. So how about how Uncle Yun did this in the so-called regenerative rice farming? So first, they do weeding, but instead of using weeding site, they use manual weeding. They use push cutter or just sickles to cut the weeds. After that, they do transplanting using their own seeds. And between harvest and planting, there's nothing else they need to do. So they just leave it, leave the paddy to grow and to be harvest. After harvest, they will let their buffalo go into the field and eat the remaining stock. This is how, they are, how simple their rice cycle is compared to the conventional one. And how about the yield? So when we started, no one have any ideas or any data regarding this village. It's called Long Samado. It's in the interior. So no one know how, how they farm and how they produce, how much they produce. And even the farmer don't know because for the farmers, they count in carong. So for them, each carong is actually different in sizes. And for the plots, every plot also in different size. So we spend years doing data collection and mapping. And we found out that yield actually similar or better than the conventional one. So for the conventional one, every acres they can get about an, a, a ton of rice. 
for our petty farmers, they can get about one to 1.5 times. So without any inputs. So this is actually very surprisingly. So when we found, found about this, and as we did deeper and do more data collection and found out how they are farming practices, then we, we found out that it is something that what we so-called regenerative agriculture. For them, is something that they, they've been practicing for many, many years. So many indigenous tribes around the world actually practicing what we so-called the regenerative agriculture, but they don't have a term to it. For them, it's best to work with nature and let the nature provide. So once we found out, and we also have our own traceability system to actually let the consumer to scan the product and to know where their rice is coming from. So every plot is owned by different farmers, farmed by different people, and that's what we want to let the consumer to know. So how they can achieve that? So without doing any inputs, but they can achieve a similar or better yield than the conventional one. It's because they have a balanced ecosystem. So that's after a few years when we're working with them, then we only found out that that's their secret recipe. So in conventional one, farming is quite straightforward. So you plant the crops, you apply the fertilizer, then you do the tilling, and you apply the agrochemical, then that's what you get, you, you sell it for money. So it's very direct, it's a um, formula that you can actually copy and paste and apply everywhere else. So whenever you facing a pest issue, you, there's a, definitely a, a pesticide or a solution for it. So you just need to apply the certain chemical to it. For them, it's very direct. But for a balanced ecosystem to work, it's not as easy as that. So in, in, in nature, so what we so-called the fertilizer MPK is actually coming from the bacteria. So they extract from the minerals in the soil, they actually, then they release it back for the plant. And in return, the, the plant actually provides them the nutrient after they do the photosynthesis. So there is the coexist relationship between the bacteria and the plants altogether. So as you can see, there's no so-called monocropping in nature. Every very diverse plants go together because that's what they need for all these microbes beneath the, the soil to, to be able to survive. So for bacteria, there's no so-called bad or the good bacteria. Every bacteria, when they are overpopulated, is actually um, bad for the plant. So how they regulate itself, they actually there are predators within the soil that actually eat this bacteria to control their population. So if you apply fertilizer or you apply the agrochemical, you kill all these microbes in between. So when the microbes is no longer exist in the soil, then human need to apply the fertilizer in order for the plant to have enough nutrient to grow. So same things for wheat. We don't like wheat. Farmers don't like wheat. They, they, they hate wheat. So a lot of farmers we will see, uh, not all farmers, the conventional one, they don't like to see wheat in their farm because they think uh, they are trying to uh, compete nutrient for, from the crops. So they, they, they want to kill all the wheat. So the, the more easiest way, the easiest way they do is with the weedy side. So they kill all the weeds, but at the same time, they kill all the fungi, all the worms, all the, worms, all the bacteria inside the soil as well. So actually that uh, make the soil turning um, bad. It's not making better, actually turn it into a degraded soil because all this weed actually coming to help. So if you notice, all uh, the, the, the most common weed that the, the farmers hate is actually the lala. So, but the lala only grow on very dry and hard soil because that is their condition to thrive. So if you con continue to let your soil barren, um, of course the first weed to come and grow is the lala. No matter how much we decide to apply, it will grow because that's their function in nature actually to help to turn this hard and degraded soil into softer and fertile soil. So if your soil transform into a healthier soil, the lalang actually cannot survive. They will actually go standard or they can't even germinate. Then there's the time for other plants to grow. So there is a cycle of nature. So it's a very complex system that actually you cannot disregard any elements. So if you take out 
the, the bacteria. Then the other um, predator that fit on the bacteria will die. So like a lot of farmers don't like snails, they don't like the pests, but if you took them out, actually they are the decomposer. They, they, eat, they fed on all the unhealthy plants and all the falling leaves and turn into compost. And the nutrient, that's the nutrient for the plant. So if you took out all this, the soil is just merely the medium. It's no longer a uh, organism. So actually it's a living thing. The entire soil is a living thing. So if you take care of this, if you take care of the nature, the nature will provide. You just let the nature do, do its work. So less work actually needed for you to farm. It's actually very easy. So for our farmers, uh, planting paddy, although it's very hard doing the planting and harvest, but they only need to plant. They need to work for two months in a year. There's a planting, one month for the planting, and another month for the harvest. And they will have more than enough for them to survive the entire year. So beside rice farmer, we also have our ginger farmer who actually practice the similar so-called regenerative agriculture. So if you know about ginger, like of course Bentong ginger is quite famous. The plant in a row, monocropping all, all only ginger. So but it's very hard uh, if you heard about how to plant ginger in that manner because a lot you need to take care of the fungi a lot of fertilizer need to apply in order for you to grow the ginger. But how our farmers grow their ginger is they grow in the forest. As you can see, they, they just dig the ginger out after 10 months. So what they did, they just slash the, the bushes and the shrub. Sometimes they do the burning, but they didn't cut the trees. So after they did that, they plant the ginger. So actually ginger grow better under the shade. So they just leave it for 10 months. Then they come back to collect their, their, their crops or collect the ginger. So for them is tanam and bia. So it's, it's a kind of concept of the regenerative agriculture or we call the natural farming. So you just plant and you just leave it and you let the nature to do their work. It's easier for the farmer. So if the farmer um, put the agrochemical that kill the microbes in the soil, and now the farmer need to do all this job previously has been done by all these microbes. For example, earthworm. So you kill all the earthworm in the soil. Their job is actually loosen the soil and actually decompose the leaf. Then ended up if no earthworm exists, then you need to do, use a killer. So you need to crunch and smash all the soil into small particles in order for it to plant. But that's the effectiveness compared to the earthworm is actually uh, Earth is much better because they work 24 hours. Then without any cost, what you need to do is just take care of the soil. So we have our pepper farmer in Syrian. So previously, uh, previously his, um, how he plants is like the normal conventional way because that's how they been taught. So you need to apply all a set of chemicals in order for you to plant pep black pepper. Then we, we told him about um, the entire idea of regenerative agriculture, how you can do it without all these chemicals and end up you actually produce a much better quality crops and you can fetch a better price. And he's um, very brave to actually get on board to turn the entire black pepper farm into organic. What he does is just intercropping with other crops and stop applying all these chemicals. And now he actually produce one of the best black pepper um, in Malaysia, the, the, the flavor is just different. So for the past six years, we have been working with three, these three indigenous farming communities of course Sabah and Sawa, and sell their produce here to um, West Malaysia, to the peninsula. So we have our rice and we have the grains as well. As well. So all these products um, have their unique selling point. So aside from being chemical free, uh, there's no chemicals input, they also have high nutritional values. All these rice are actually alum, so it's native to Malaysia. Maybe a lot of us didn't see it before or never tried it before. They have their own taste and fragrance. 
So we help them to actually package into a, a nice, nicely look product and market it as a chemical free product in a, as a premium product. So here's our, a list of our partners from hotels to fine dining, from government, corporate and organic retail shop. We started off with our own e-commerce retail, then slowly we get attraction uh, after some of the chefs actually try our products. And they realized that the quality of the rice, especially the rice, is different from what we got in the market. So slowly, uh, for the six years, we grow our community. And the farmer has actually got recognition. So uh, because a lot of young people think farming is actually it's not a uh, job that can bring you income. Even their parents are doing so. So they don't encourage their children actually um, continue farming. They encourage them to actually go out. Um, but what we do here actually did provide an option for them. See, actually farming um, can be generated income as well. So it's not necessarily to be a low income job. So it can be, a, you can produce a very high quality product. So what we, after we learned throughout the years, um, with all the other three communities, what advantage they have is they already have a very, in a set of farming practices that actually help them to do the sustainable farming, to continue farm at the same piece of land and to produce high quality products. So what we do is merely just to conserve it and promote uh, other farming practices that can integrate with their current one. And last year, we have a chance to actually uh, work with Global Peace Foundation in Malaysia. So they have other communities actually facing other issues, not like our farming community in Sabah and Sarawak. So here, they are the Jakun community in Pahang, in a place called Moazam close to Longkin. So they used to be hunter and gatherers, but um, because of deforestation or um, plantation, they're forced to leave the forest or the for forest no longer there. So they don't, they don't have the skill to actually farm. Because what they've been known or they've been taught is to gather food and resources in the forest. Now the forest is gone, they're forced to stay, uh, they're forced to stay in the same place but they don't know how to do the farming. So what they learn from nearby or outside is more, uh, most of it is conventional farming. So they're trying to farm with the fertilizer, they try to uh, farm the cash crop, but ended up the land become degraded. As you can see in the photos, it become like desert. So the soil become hard and dry. So hardly anything can survive. So most of, um, they can only grow like those hardy crops like um, banana, serai, or tapioca, the ubi kayu. So sometimes the, the, the soil is degraded so much, even the serai cannot survive. So when global peace come and talk to us, they actually first they, they want to commercialize their serai. But when we see, when we look at their, uh, their condition, we think um, common, common Commercial the soil rice is not the solution for them because um, in future if the soil becomes so bad, can't, they can't even grow anything. So what is the point of selling the soil rice anymore? Because they can't even grow things on the piece of land. So we were thinking, why not we share the, the knowledge that all these regenerative agricultural practices to them so they can start to regenerate, to rehabilitate their soil and start um, producing their own food. So this is how it started last year uh, in November, November. So based on that, we designed a regenerative food forest training module for them across six months. So every month actually we will teach them, share with them different things from the principles, land preparation, how to plant, how to do the best control to the harvest, and most importantly, to scale up. So it's across six months and apply the three um, very basic principles of regenerative agriculture. So we simplify a lot of things because there are a lot of different terms about regenerative agriculture, how to do that, I think, um, 
you can easily find it in Google and everywhere. But through our experience, actually, the most important thing is only these three. So first of all, you need to apply mounting. So this is actually the code for all the bacteria and a code. So they'll break down organic matter and start to uh, transform the soil. And the second is the diversity. You need to have diverse types of plants growing on top of the soil. So regardless if it's wheat or your edible plants, the, the best is edible, but if not, you let the wheat to grow because they will start to help you to rehabilitate your soil. So always let it fully grown. Then the third and most importantly, no agrochemicals. So the moment you apply, you will start to damage your soil. So that is, that is the virtuous cycle start. So when you apply once, then you have to apply more on the second round and you will be dependent on all these chemicals because the bacteria or all these microbes no longer exist in the soil to help you. So no tilling, no plowing because they will destroy, they will damage the structure of the soil that all these plants and microbes have built. So only these three principles. And we give a list of suggestions of plants that can grow uh, with different strata. So the strata mean different high and different growth cycles uh, and plant very dense. So the plant that can that is suitable for current condition also will actually thrive. Those cannot survive, so we'll just leave it. So we won't force it to grow certain things that can is not suitable yet until the soil is uh, start to recover or become more fertile, then you can try those vegetables that require um, more nutrients to grow. For example, like pumpkins or the leafy plant that you see in the market. Actually, those plants require a lot of nutrients or fertile soil to grow. But before that, we're growing serai, we're growing those like native edible plants that actually um, can survive in these hardy conditions. So different growth cycles, we will encourage the perennial plants over the annual plants. Then within three years, as the soil recover, then they can move on to other places and grow bigger. So that the, the farm can grow bigger just by doing that. And using the, the seeds and plant that actually been planted. So they don't need to buy seedling or seeds. So this is the idea of they can start on their own and the independence. So you don't need to rely on inputs from outside. So the module is um, very straightforward. We have very short theory classes, so there's not much of theory you need to talk about. I think more importantly is how you do it. So we only spend a very short session, um, gather everyone together to talk about the theory, then we straight away go into uh, practical. So theory session, we will gather in, in the community hall or some places. We will show them more graphical, more visual based because uh, all this theory, scientific name, or all this uh, so-called the chemical compounds is actually very foreign to them. So more, most importantly, is actually the visual. So how you how you tell a different type of soil. So why is a good and bad? Where you, uh, how you can do that? So it's more visual based. So theory aside, it's only less than one hour session. The most of the time we spend in the field. So we will have a pilot plot that will bring everyone, then we show them how to do it. So every village we went, then we show them. Then after that, they're going to do it themselves. So they can try it and they will bring back the tools and the seeds and try it off. So uh, this is uh, one of the participants in Kampong Chenodong is called Rowena. So before the classes, we actually gather them and we uh, ask them about their issue about farming. So her issue is she having a lot of snails issue. So whenever she want to plant the edible plants, the, the crops she should try to plant will attack by the snails. So every late evening, she actually will go down to her farm and to collect the snails. Every every day she can collect about one tin of that. But even so, the snail problem doesn't dissolve. It's still there and become even worse. So the snail is like her nightmare. So after we introduce her about the regenerative agriculture and the concept behind it. So snail essentially is not a pest. It exists because the soil is unhealthy. 
So you just, you need to take care of the soil instead of taking care of the snails. So after she tried that, just within like five months, you can see the result. So she say, uh, now uh, there's no longer having snail issue. It's not that the snails is not there, it's still there, but just that the snail is not attacking or eat a, a plant. So you go, the snail will go on and attack other weaker plant on the side of the, of the farm. So now you can see it's fully grown. And this area is very dry. They don't have irrigation. They're even having issue with their water supply. So to grow in this kind of condition, I think uh, regenerative agriculture is very suitable for them. So you just simple tools they can do it on their own. So another example farmers is in Kampong Kualing, Palong. So you can see the result, the transformation in just within five months. Although it's just uh, starting, the process will take about one or two years for the soil to fully recover or even longer. But in that process, you already can have food and something to eat. So that is something that for them is very easy to adapt. So before we come in, they only have the three types of crops I mentioned before, like the banana, tapioca, and serai. So this is after six months. This is the, the, the crop that can grow within their degraded soil. So this, you can start to see the soil start to recover and things start to grow, the life start to come back. And most importantly, is uh, less labor intensive. And the, one of the feedback the farmer give us is actually they don't know what else to do because after they do that, they plant, nothing else to do. They just look at the, their, their farm because we, we told them to let the wheat to grow, let it grow. So they said nothing else to do. It's very free. So they, they, and now they go and open up more farm because while waiting uh, all these crops grow, they actually open, they can op have, uh, have the time to open up more farms and plant using the same uh, method. So the result is there are 42 families across the five or six villages. 81% uh, is actually females because the, uh, most of the, the male participants, uh, not participants, their husband had to work. So actually the, the housewives are very interested because they have a lot of time to stay at home. So the variety of food from three, just three to four, they increase to up to 24 varieties. So the nutrition wise, um, for sure they will diversify. So they are very happy with that and they start to actually look for other native plants around their area. And what they've been seen before in the forest, they start to cultivate on, on the farm. So the success rate is very high because we only use simple tools that they can actually continue farming with the same set of tools again and again. No need to worry about, need to purchase, input or extra cost for the machine or maintenance. So the set just given at them at the starting, then they can actually continue to, to plant more on their own. So by looking at that um, food security issue, the current global issue we're facing actually is how we use our land and also most importantly is a consumer behavior. Uh, in this chart, you can see most of our agricultural land actually we use for the livestock. It's a meat and dairy. But after all we spend, we only, only contribute to a very minimal, uh, we so-called the protein supply, it's the calorie supply in order to, for human to survive. So compared to crops, only 33% of land use, but it contributed more than 80%. And bear in mind that 23% of crops, a lot of them are also what we call the um, cash crop that cannot uh, be consumed, like oil palm. But with that, they already can cover 83%. So um, why this happened is because the consumer behavior. Because the consumer demand more mix and end up the farmers that produce more meat to the market. So actually, these two things need to balance all together. What we can do as a, from the consumer point of view is we just having less meat, we eat more local producers. For the farmers, probably they need to start to rethink how they farm 
their crops, what they want to plant in their land. Because if you having livestock uh, in the conventional manner, actually it's not good for the soil. The soil will become degraded because over over grazing. So one idea, um, how we can survive just based on sustainable farming. So if you use sustainable farming, one farmer can work on one acre of land and it can produce about 600 kilo of food every year. So that's very conservative. Uh, if a very fertile land it can produce up to 12 tons of food. But here we just take half of it. So it's about 6,000 kilo. So, and one person, we need about 1,000 kilo food to survive. So based on these numbers, we can say that one acre of land actually can fit or actually can supply to six person. So we can ensure the food for six persons with one farmers, including the farmers. So if we apply these numbers to the current agriculture practices or the land use in Malaysia, with 2.15 million acres of agricultural land. So if we're farming with sustainable farming, we just need 25% of it. We can feed the entire nation. Although it's very difficult to achieve this number, probably we just need 10% of it. It's already more than enough to reduce all the import or the reliance or dependence about all the, all the food import that we're currently doing. So the food security we're talking about, actually, we can solve it within ourselves by just using regenerative agriculture. So uh, if we look at worldwide, the numbers even worse. So we actually need less. What this means is actually a lot of land has been waste to produce things that cannot be eat or it cannot serve as food. So we are wasted a lot of land just to produce something that cannot be okay, cannot didn't contribute to food security. So although some of the land uh, is not suitable to grow crops, but that uh, itself doesn't affect that the, the proof is actually we actually can produce enough food for ourselves. So the problem is because now a lot of farmers tend to think that we need to produce more. Actually, uh, we don't have this problem. We don't need to produce more. We just need to produce the right crops. So, um, I think everyone still can remember when the COVID hit our country during early this year. So, the pandemic. So, we have our very first MCO because of the COVID-19. And that's where the panic buying is happening. So I can still remember everyone rushed to the, the shopping mall to, to, to get whatever they can get, the food, and stock it up. And ended up, up to a point, you can't even get food, even you have the money. So the, the, the food become like so, uh, like there's not enough food and as the, all the import food are actually stuck in the pork clank and the, a lot of vegetables from the Cameron Highland cannot um, transport it down because of the restriction of MCO. This is how uh, fragile it is our current food system in the urban urban setting. So that, that actually uh, struck me very, very hard. It's like we, we actually don't have enough food for ourselves, even we have a lot of money. So after the panic, about two or three weeks, uh, we contacted Uncle Leon, the, the farmers we I mentioned at the beginning in Long Samado. So we are curious, like what, how is going to happen to them? So we call them, call him and ask, hey, how about you? How how's your village? He said, mm, actually nothing happened. So they still live as usual. They have more than enough food for themselves. They can last for a year. Uh, the, the only issue they have is they don't have enough seasoning because they don't cannot go down to town to get the salt or sauce. But other than that, they got more than enough food. If they continue to plant, there's no food issue. 
Whereas for us here is our rice stock for the country at the moment is only can last for three months if the pandemic continues. So which means if three months that the close down or the lockdown didn't resolve, we didn't open up the border, we will have not enough rice to feed our people. So that's how serious it is. So um, I think with this in mind, the farming or the agriculture should go back to the their, their, their core objective of farming is to produce food. So first is to produce enough food to feed the people and then taking care of the environment to ensure the sustainability. Then only think about money. Like what we did with our farmers, they have enough for themselves, then they sell the excess to us as a premium product, as their income. So if the product cannot sell, they still have enough food. Not the other way around. You plan for the money, you sell everything for the money, and you get the money to buy the food. So it's very uh, ironic for, for the farmers to actually buy food while they themselves can produce. So with that, um, I'll end my presentation. For, for those that want to know more about Langit, they can scan this QR code. It will lead you to our website and you can buy our product there, all the rice, ginger powder, black pepper corns. And for those smallholders, farmers, farmers or landholders that are interested in regenerative agriculture, you can actually contact us. So see what kind of collaboration we can come up with. So with that, thank you. Thank you so much, Shia. It was a wonderful presentation. Um, Shia, if uh, you would uh, switch on your uh, camera, it would be really good. We would like to see you. Uh, you can't see me? No, I think your camera is off. Oh, it's off. Let me see. Okay. Can you see me now? Uh, no. Okay. Okay, I think some people can see you. I think, yeah, yeah, okay, I can see you also now. All right, because yeah. I can see myself at the corner there. <laughs> All right, okay, no All problem. Right. Okay, thank you so much, Shia. It was a wonderful presentation. I have so many questions to ask. I think if I take a whole day, it wouldn't be enough, uh, but uh, we don't have so much time. So uh, we would like to ask our um, participants to ask any questions if they want. So there is one question over here where I would like to um, um, post that question. Okay, so Pavi, she says that uh, we can also introduce some beneficial bacteria and fungus to the farmers if they can learn how to produce these micro microorganisms. They will be able to have a sustainable outcome from the farming. So are there any thoughts on this? Um... I think it's one of the way to do it, but how we do it is actually we take it from nature. So all the so-called the beneficial fungi and bacteria is actually already exist in the healthy soil. So for those that already have it, you just need to take care of the, of the soil. For those who don't have it, yes, you can introduce it. So you can either like what she, she mentioned, you can cultivate, you bring it to introduce to the soil, or you can actually take it from the healthy soil from the forest. It's, a, it's the same thing, but the most important, you need to produce the host, the, the housing for the bacteria. So, for example, if you apply to a barren soil, you didn't plant anything, you just like conventional one, you apply it, you, you just plant your cash crop, but in and out, all the bacteria will die. And you need to reapply re every time to plant. But what we encourage the farmers to do, actually, you need to do just now the three principles. That three principles actually provide the housing for all these bacteria and microbes. So you only need to introduce once. So then the bacteria will actually can grow within the soil itself. You don't need to buy and reapply again. So for us, it's not so much on, on whether it can cultivate or not. Yes, it will help. But the most important thing, you need to build the housing and then you to ensure that the, the sustainability of the soil itself can last longer. Yeah, you can take it from nature, you can do it in the lab, but it will end up uh, the same result. But most importantly, the soil. All right. 
Thank you so much. Uh, that's really great. Um, if anybody has any questions, please post it in the chat section. Okay. In the meanwhile, there are a few questions from my side. May I ask you, please? Is it okay if I uh, can ask you some few questions from my side? Ah, uh, sure, sure. Well, I was wondering, like uh, you talked about uh, how regenerating the degraded land. Like mm. uh, there are a lot of lands which are almost infertile and uh, they're not growing anything over there. So you help them uh, regenerate this land, right? Yeah. So uh, what I saw from the slides, uh, what I understood from the slides is that you do some mulching and then uh, you just uh, give the nature, uh, you, let, you just let the nature do its work. So I just wanted to ask, um, is it sufficient enough to regain all the nutrients? Do we need to add few other chemicals or something? Or is it sufficient? Um, of course, for degraded soil is insufficient if you just didn't put in anything. So the mulching we mentioned within that the regenerative is actually they can gather from surrounding. Mm. So we will encourage them to gather as much mulching as possible. Because for those land that are already degraded because they are lack of organic matter. Yes. So they cannot produce enough for the land itself. So I think at first they need to get those, but you don't need to buy. So you can get up for surrounding. Then of course we'll do some uh, cracking of the soil for the very first round, for those very hard and solid soil. So you can see in the photos they use the fork, the mm -hmm. cracking, but that's only for the very first round of land preparation. They don't need to do that after, after that, because once you do that, they actually grow a lot of green mammals. Mm -hmm. So it's like all types of weeds and legumes to let the root to actually see in all the cracked soil to hold the soil structure. So that is the process. Then um, we will actually encourage them to actually bring some soil from the forest nearby. Not need to be a lot, it's a little bit mm -hmm. because all the microbes are within that. Or you can actually get compost or vermin compost or the bacteria or the EM that in the market, but you need to provide the, the bed for them and only you apply. So I think that's the process of rehabilitation at first. Once the things start growing and the soil actually will start to recover. So all those nutrients is like, for example, nitrogen is provided by the legumes. So we grow a lot of legumes on top of that. So after the, the, the all this so-called the green manual plant is uh, mature, we actually cut and put back as much. So that is uh, produced by the soil, the, the, the land itself. So then the process will be repeated for a few cycles. So it's almost uh, two months every cycle because the legume and the fast growing uh, weeds are actually grow very fast. So every two months, they can be start the process and they can build out the, the, the actually the organic matter within the soil. Uh, to kick start, you need to think for all that. Wow, that's great. Uh, yes. But is it possible? Uh, is it possible to grow all the kind of uh, fruits and vegetables? Because I understand there are few trees, few plants which require more nutrition compared to the others. So, mm -hmm. uh, is it possible to grow all of them? Depends on the condition of the soil. So, not all the soil can grow what they want to grow. So, it, it, instead of what we want to grow. Actually, we need to uh, see what can grow on the soil. So what we uh, encourage them to do is actually is grow as many types of plants as possible. And the plant will tell you which one actually suitable. So for those that cannot survive, of course, it's not their time yet. It just means the condition is not right for them. But for those that are in the right condition, they will try. So that, uh, we, that, that one we encourage to, for, uh, for them to grow. Then after three or four months, then they try again for those plants they want to plant. But we don't. We, we will tell them don't force it because if you want to push for it, you need to do more work. Like what we did here. So if you want to plant chili in that kind of soil, right, you require a lot of work because there are a lot of pests. You need to put in a lot of nutrients. It, and now you need to buy all the inputs. But instead, you plant those doesn't require that much nutrient, like. You plant down Galadea, you plant Udicayo, you plant Sarai first. You build out the nutrient within the soil first. Then when it's healthy enough, you try the, the chili again, and the chili will grow in it. So 
and just now you see in the photo the pumpkins or the um Lufa is actually throughout the end of the of the region regeneration it's not during the first month so the first two months someone tried it failed because the soil is just not good enough but after six months they try it again uh, then those plants that require nutrients can start to grow so i think uh it's planting the right plant at the right time that require less effort if you try to force it and you make it end up doing more works I think that's the, the, the best concept of the retention. Uh, so it's not only hard work, but it also involves a lot of smart work, huh? Yeah. Okay, we have uh, um, a question from uh, Josephine. She says that, is there a difference, she's asking, is there a difference using uh, the fork compared to the hole? Uh, pardon, can you repeat it? Is there a difference using the fork compared to the hole? The hole? Yes, um, the hole. So the idea of no tilling, so we mentioned no tilling, so we don't want to turn the soil upside down. We don't want to crunch the soil. We just want to crack it to allow air and water to enter and the root to grow deep into. So the difference of the fork, what it does is actually they only crack it. You know turning it, the, the, you know turning the soil, but with the hole, it will actually turn the soil around so it will become a, if you, the soil is very hard you become a bump or like a whole bunch you will actually will pick it up so actually it will destroy the soil structure so it's actually uh it will reset all the work you, you try to do to rehabilitate the, the, the soil so so what what it does is like like feeling so if you want to rehabilitate your, your soil is actually building out the structure that they try and um, start to recover but after that you do feeling so you just crash it. Actually, you actually um, destroy all the soil structure and all the fungi that work underneath. Then you need to start all over again. So it's actually you repeating and you are actually respecting all your effort trying to recover. So we, we don't encourage to use pole to reduce it, but we use pole to actually do the ditches for those areas that have water clogging issue. So you, um, you have you control the water flow. Wow, that's great. I hope, uh, Josephine, that answers your question. Uh, uh, she's asking where we can buy the fork. What is it called? The unit, what is it called? They don't have a really specific name. So people used to call it deep plow fork. So deep plow is which means something like the conventional one you do plowing. So they, they call it deep plow because the, 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 the edge are longer. So they call it deep plow fork. So uh, local, I don't think you can find, but you can fabricate the design. The design is quite simple. You can Google it. You can just normal um, blacksmith can do. They just cut cut the metal steel, then you can do it. Or you can get it from China. Uh, you can look for the Taobao or Alibaba. They have few suppliers. They do supply this kind of fork in this kind of design. But you need to be able to. Um, Read Chinese. Oh, okay. Or some some website they do translate Chinese into Bahasa or English, so you can get from that like AliExpress, things like that. So you can find it. Is sometimes cheaper to fabricate locally if you for the uh, contact. But if you don't, then you can get it from China. Oh, great. Okay. Uh, then there's another question from Jennifer. Is there any brochure or literature that spells out the steps for regenerating degraded soil? Uh, you mean any brochure? Yeah, any brochure or any literature that helps you in understanding the different steps of uh, regenerating the degraded soil. Mm, I think you can search online. There are very, uh, there are different, there are a lot of school of thought on regenerative agriculture. So uh, regenerative agriculture is uh, actually quite new terms. Uh, coming out, I think, quite recently. But uh, they have basically four principles. It's like they, they actually can, uh, how, how to say, can help to solve climate change problem, taking care of the soil, things like that. But um, all the agriculture, they actually fall under these four principles. There's actually a lot. So, for example, some of the organic farming actually fall under regenerative agriculture. Some of the traditional farming, like our farmers, is fall under the regenerative agriculture. So uh, like natural farming, 
by uh, Masanobu Fukuoka. So it's for under regenerative agriculture like 60 or 70 years ago. So our farmers is nearly uh, the Malaysia version of the natural farming of paddy. Uh, or you can refer to biodynamic. So biodynamic is also another method that fall under regenerative agriculture. Uh, permaculture, I think later on we have a session of it. It's also fall under regenerative agriculture. Um, what else we have? Syntropic agroforestry is also fall under regenerative agriculture. So there are so many different ways you can regenerate your soil. So it's not one way can do it or, or one definite way to do it. So there are many ways you can do. Just which way are more suitable or which way you feel that is more easier to understand. So for us, our method or our ways of regenerative agriculture is more similar to natural farming. So that is combined the traditional wisdom of the indigenous community with some of the organic practices out there at level. So that's our fundamental is natural farming. So there are many, many other ways you can search online. So I think before you start, I will recommend you to read about One Straw Revolution from Masanobu Fukuoka. You can find you can find the ebook online. So they, they explain very well on the whole concept of this. Hope, hope it helps. All right. I hope that answers the question. I hope that answers the question. Thank you so much. Uh, then uh, Sui Lin, uh, she's asking if uh, what do we do with the weeds? Should we just leave them to be? Mm, for the weeds, actually, they have their own function, like they have their work to do. So like Lalang, their work is to help to crack the soil to soften the soil. So if you don't want particular type of weeds, actually, you can replace them with a similar family of the weeds to an edible one. So like Lalang, you cannot eat, but you can replace it with Sarai. So which means the soil needs this type of plant, but not necessary to be Lalang. Lalang is the type of weed. So you can replace it with Sarai or you can replace it with like Paddy. So it's a set under the same family, but it's edible. So you 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 won't stop the regenerative process. You just slowly replace it. So you need to know, you need to start observe and understand on what type of weed are growing. And you start to replace them with those edible ones so they can have produce from the land as the regenerative process begin. So I think that's the replacement and succession process that happening throughout the entire years. So you slowly, slowly replace them. If you don't want to plant anything, you just leave it grow. So that's the best. But if you want to have something out of it, then you replace it with edible plants. So that's the way to do. So it's, you need to know a lot of different type of plants. Mm -hmm. So in order for you to start to do the replacement. Great, great. Thank you so much. Then Josephine wants to know if there are any common green manure plants that we can use for home gardening. Green manure, the most easy you can get is from the market is mung bean. So you get is very cheap uh, few ringgit from, from the supermarket. You just throw it on top. So you can germinate easily. So just that you probably need to cut it before you start to put. So because when you start to put, you will take uh, take out nutrients from the soil, but we want it to actually generate nutrients instead. So when you start to flower, you just cut it, chop, um, chop and drop. So you just cut it and put it as much. Then you can grow other 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 plants. So mung beans is definitely one of the easiest you can get in the market. So other other than that, if you look in the Shopee, there are other green manuals like sun ham. Even you can use the 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 sawi, the, the mustard vegetables. So all these different uh, green manures that they don't have uh, what, what is so-called um, certain pl plants that you, you need uh, to grow. You can just as simple as you can collect seeds from the roadside. So you can see that there's a weed grow around the roadside. You can just collect that seed. You just throw it. So that will help. So once they grow, same thing, you just chop it. And as you drop it as much, you actually sow the seed you want it to grow at the same time. So you don't simply just chop it and leave it. So you need to chop and grow and plant at the same time. So for in order for the replacement to happen. Otherwise the weed will grow back. So that that's a process. So mung bean is the, the cheapest and easiest to get. I think uh, we can take one last question um, from Tan. Um, 
I have very deep rooted weeds. Should I remove them and replace with edible plant? The uh, land is also very dry and hard. What plant is it? You mentioned. Uh, she says I have very deep rooted weeds. Should I remove them and replace with some edible plants? Mm, if you got more space around, you can plant other plants. I would suggest you leave it. You probably just prune it. So uh, it's better to have a perennial or we call it evergreen plants within your farm. Um, because uh, if you only plant annual, annual is which means those you have after a few months you harvest, uh, it's not good for the soil because after you harvest, the soil will start to compacting because there's no plants growing on top. So it's better to have uh, evergreen plants within your, your farm. So you can actually prune it. So it will grow back, then you just use all the prune leaf as a pouch. So it's even better you grow a few of them. So you just prune and you plant the, 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 the vegetables. As your vegetable grows, it will regrow itself. The moment you harvest, you prune again. So the, the, the process repeat. So you're using as your organic matter, matter provider. So it's not necessary to, to, to remove. All right, uh, it was great, uh, Shia. Wonderful explanation. I'm sure there are a lot of questions which everybody has. I think we can uh, personally leave an email or, um, you know, you have a website. So maybe we can contact uh, you through that. Yeah. We have already shared the details. So maybe we can do that later because this is very interesting topic. And uh, I think one hour is not sufficient, right? Yeah. yeah. Okay, so thank you so much. It was a wonderful session. Uh, you really enlightened us with uh, wonderful knowledge. And um, that's it. So we really would like to thank you so much. So nice. You can reach out to us through our email. Or you can find out more about us in langit.com.my. So yeah, we'll have the link, I think, later in the session. Okay, Shia, thank you.